So Academic Agent, who is quite an influential YouTuber in the sort of broader dissident right scene, has published this video called Against Ideology. And I think this is quite a weak argument that he presents in this video. And I want to respond to it not just because AA himself has a large audience and uh, is quite respected in these circles, but also because this line of thought that he presents, that basically um, truth and morality and ideology basically don't matter. All that matters is power and all of these things are just sort of uh, post hoc justifications for uh, seeking, achieving, maintaining power. This line of thought has become increasingly popular in the right. People that came out of the sort of NRX scene, um, people that are influenced by Nietzscheanism, um, this kind of pure power politics way of viewing the world has become quite popular. And I think it's very damaging because for any radical movement that is outside power, that is critiquing the system, their greatest weapons basically uh, against the system and undercutting its legitimacy is a claim to truth and a claim to moral legitimacy uh, that our ideas, our people should rule um, because we represent the common good, we re represent the general interest. We are correct, uh, we are the moral people and there are immoral people in charge. So this undercuts the whole basis of legitimacy for any political movement when people assert it. If it's all just power, if it's all just competing biological imperatives, um, if it's all just copes for people's own selfishness, then why not just become a liberal? Why not just uh, join the NGO complex and benefit from the system? So I think this is a self-refuting way of looking at the world. I think it's a harmful way of looking at the world for anyone that actually wants to make any kind of change. And I think it's wrong. So let's take a look at this video from Academic Agent. In this video, I want to lay out the case for why ideology does not really matter half as much as everybody thinks it does. Vilfredo Pareto wrote a very long and complex book in 1916 called The Mind and Society which contains the bulk of his contributions to what is called elite theory today. If you'd like to know more about that in detail, I'd recommend taking my course, Foundations of Politics, and picking up the textbook for that course, The Populist Illusion. Here I am going to try to keep things super simple and focus on just one of Pareto's ideas, that most of our written laws, and before that our ideas, are post hoc rationalizations of what he calls sentiments. We might just say instincts. Human behavior is fundamentally non-logical, yet there is a deep-seated human need to appear rational. Thus humans act and then generate arguments to justify those actions after the fact. This idea was lent a lot of weight by empirical research almost a century after Pareto was writing which is summarised in popular books such as Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow and Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind. However, where researchers such as Kahneman and Haidt draw these conclusions at the level of individual decision-making, Pareto is talking about society-wide decisions as embodied in the actions of those in power, also known as the elites. So first of all, when he brings up these books, Thinking Fast and Slow and The Righteous Mind, they don't actually support what he's claiming. So his claim is that um, people act selfishly and then they come up with reasons for that. They come up with ideology to justify it after the fact. Now, the books he's referencing argue for this kind of moral foundations theory, that people are kind of predisposed pre-programmed to uh, value certain kinds of moral values over others. So, you know, liberals are higher in things like harm avoidance, they value equality and fairness more, um, you know, conservatives place more value on, on justice and meritocracy. That's all true, but this is, uh, this is predispositions that people have. This is not completely determinative. You can't 
determine exactly what someone's politics is going to be uh, based on these values. Um, and, you know, these values aren't necessarily completely inborn either. Uh, and you do find people that have, you know, what would be considered like a liberal um, predispositions that move from the left to the right because they're convinced by better arguments and vice versa. People change ideologies. You know, if you look at the early 20th century fascist movements, um, many of the founders were former Marxists. So this isn't set in stone, uh, and even if you know, even if you could determine where ninety nine percent of the population is going to be based on these uh, metrics, based on these moral tendencies they have, uh, that still doesn't say that there's like no correct answer. Um, you know, people can be predisposed to move towards a viewpoint that's true and one that's false. Um, this isn't like a, a refutation of truth, the fact that people have, you know, hardwired tendencies that predispose them to certain beliefs. So this doesn't actually back up what he's saying, that all people um, just act to, you know, justify their impulses. But let's carry on and see where he goes with this. When it comes to power, there are only really two arguments for the sake of Simplicity, let me summarize the first as follows. BS, 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 therefore we should rule. This argument we can call, following another elite theorist, Gayantano Mosca, the political formula of any regime. However, for practical purposes in the running of things, those in power need a second argument. BS, 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 therefore we were correct to follow our course of action. Now since for Pareto societies are defined entirely by their elites, all other arguments besides those made by power in the service of their own power are essentially noise. Note that both these arguments take place after a group is already in power, and after that group has already acted. The action comes first and the argument follows in both cases. Why should you be king, Charlemagne? Is it because you crushed all your rivals with sword and lance? Uh, no, it's because I was sent by God. Oh, oh okay then. God save the king. Henry, uh, why should you be the head of the church then and not the pope? Uh, is, is it because you wanted uh, Mary Anne Boleyn or something like that? Oh, no. It's because I was sent by God. I don't know. Go and read Martin Luther or something. Just go away. So, uh, Vladimir, aren't you basically an autocratic dictator? What happened to the rule by the workers? Uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat is vested in me, and this is a necessary phase in order to get to true communism or something. Also, we need to hire some managers because workers don't know what they're doing. Okay, enough questions. Go directly to Gulag. Hey, Tone, why are all our leaders just versions of you glorified managers then? Um, the future is inevitable and you can either be on the right side of it or get left behind. Let's not waste time with politics and just get on with what needs to be done. Oh, all right then. God save the king. You can have hours of fun doing your own version of this. But in the end, you'll see that every argument either has the form BSBS, BSBS, BS, BS, therefore we should rule or BSBS, BSBS, BS, therefore we were correct to follow our course of action. Now, those of you of a more ideological bent might be screaming at your monitors. You might be saying things like, the BS matters, AA, the BS matters, which is to say that the content of the BS has a real effect on the world. And this is true. But the content of the BS is generated entirely by the question of which group is in power. The divine right of kings means, in the end, that whatever Charlemagne or King Henry here says goes. Likewise, communism was, in the final analysis, whatever Lenin or later Stalin said it was. And, by exactly the same token, liberal democracy is whatever Tony Blair and his friends decided it is on any given news cycle. 
Things they want are liberal democracy, and things they don't want are a threat to democracy. This is the true nature of power. What any ruling class wants will be driven primarily by the maintenance and expansion of their own power. Okay, so at this point, it's basically, we get to his argument and it's basically question begging. So he set out to prove that all arguments for legitimacy of power are just BS post hoc rationalizations. And his argument is he presents various justifications that have been used for power, divine right of kings, um, you know, serving the proletariat's class interests, uh, advancing history, or you know, the kind of um, liberal technocratic view of things. And he says, look, uh, all these different people that were in power, um, they all have various justifications that conclude with, therefore, we should rule. Uh, well, yeah, of course, um, but he hasn't, uh, he hasn't presented an argument that these are all necessarily post hoc rationalizations. I mean, in the case of Lenin uh, and the Bolsheviks, uh, they held these views before they were in power, right? Uh, that was their justification for seizing power, something like they just, um, you know, Lenin was this non-ideological guy that took power and then he, um, you know, he just found a, a copy of Marx and he was like, well, uh, I'll use this to justify my rule. Same with Tony Blair, you know, he's coming from a, a background of, of leftism and sort of trust in liberalism. Um, and what's strange about this is AA is like a, a big Evola fan uh, and has like worked to popularize Evola and promotes traditionalism. So I'm confused. How can you be a traditionalist that thinks that they're, you know, the whole basis for uh, the traditionalism of the Ganon Evola type is that there are eternal, transcendent, universal truths. And, you know, a big part of Evola's work is actually justifying uh, the right of kings, um, the divine right of kings, um, and the, the system of government that medieval Europe had. So uh, it's very strange that academic agent would claim to subscribe to those kinds of ideas, but then he has this extreme sort of metaphysical anti-realism and moral anti-realism where all claims are just as good as the next. But again, he hasn't made an argument here. He's just presented that, yes, there are indeed various justifications for power. And then, you know, our role is to use reason uh, and use our moral faculties to determine what is a good justification for power. Um, and what makes a ruler legitimate? Are they following that justification or not? Uh, what would be a proper justification? That's what political philosophy is. But to just point out that, oh, look, there's various justifications for power through history. Therefore, all justifications for power are just post hoc rationalizations um, for power that already exists does not follow. Uh, and that's, his, that's basically his whole argument. That's his central argument is just uh, it's just a circular reasoning it's again it's begging the question when james the first of england also known as james the sixth of scotland wrote his the true law of free monarchy he argued surprise surprise that there should be basically no checks on his power in a sense james was more honest than most leaders who try to dress up their post hoc justifications for power with legalism such was the case with William of Orange, who invaded England in 1688, a foreign power, mind you, and then reached for the nearest copy of John Locke's works to justify his rule. If the other side had won, they'd have likely reached for James I's old books, which, in fact, James II did do when he was the king, uh, or maybe he'd have reached for Robert Filmer or Thomas Hobbes or whatever else. But William of Orange did not invade England because he was a staunch Lockean or for any ideological reasons at all. He did it because he sought a geostrategic position against the French and, well, because he could. He simply had the power to, especially because James II had a good number of enemies at home. But whether they reached for their Robert Filmer or for their John Locke, both sides in the struggle of the glorious revolution had the same argument bs 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 therefore we should rule 
So this is where A brings in kind of insights of elite theory and the patron theory of politics to show that, yes, you know, kings, rulers will um, provide support for ideas that justify their rule. And this is often how ideas and ideologies become hegemonic. That's true, but it doesn't say anything about the veracity of those ideas. And it doesn't say that, therefore, you know, there's no way we can determine if any of these ideas are better or worse than the other. The example <laughs> that runs contrary to this is, you know, academic agent is presenting, well, Locke was just as good as Filmer and one served one ruler's interests and one served another's. Yet, again, academic agent has written things and made videos uh, supporting Filmer's arguments over Locke. Is he doing that because he's a monarch that thinks that Filmer serves his interests better than Locke? Um, is he the king that he's, he's using Filmer to justify his rule by? Obviously not. So clearly, academic agent thinks that there's some way that he can adjudicate these competing worldviews um, that isn't just sort of what's beneficial to his gain in power. So again, it just it does not follow. Yes, ideas become hegemonic based on uh, all kinds of things, based on the, the whims of power. That's true. That's why uh, liberalism is, is universal and taken for granted now. And yet, there are people that do not subscribe to liberalism, that have critiques of liberalism. And, you know, if you want to go just all the way and say, well, uh, they must have some sort of um, biological impulse that that's serving, that that's a post hoc justification for. Well, uh, I don't see how you would validate that. And it's also just self-refuting. It's the same problem that this extreme sort of relativism runs into all the time. A is going to say that everyone is just driven by action, by biological impulses, and then afterwards, um, any ideas they come up with, any idea of truth, is just post hoc rationalization. Well, then I have no reason to believe what A is saying because he's claiming that this is some kind of uh, universal truth, but presumably he's just motivated by sort of selfish uh, impulses. So he can't make any claim to universality here. Uh, it is self refuting. And uh, the idea that you know actions happen and then the beliefs come afterwards well beliefs inform actions like we are we are storytelling uh, creatures everything we do is is based on narrative it's based on you know even our picture of the future where we want to go like i'm you know i'm gonna go downstairs and, and make coffee this is you know this is based on ideas this is based on beliefs about how things function about what will happen as, as a result of certain things so to say that actions happen and then beliefs follow it's just kind of a, a meaningless statement actions follow from beliefs um, sometimes those beliefs are you know based on uh, us sort of deluding ourselves and based on selfish impulses sometimes it's based on the truth uh, we don't just choose to believe what's true you know, I don't like choose to believe that the moon exists. It's, it's, it's something that sort of imposes itself on me. And then I take action, uh, oftentimes, that is based on those true beliefs. Um, so this is just sort of generic, like relativism, while well, everything is just, uh, everything is just motivated by selfish desires and then everything else is a cope. Well, um, you know, how do you justify that? I'm, I'm still not really hearing any arguments. Uh, it's just asserting this as uh, sort of obviously true, you know, that the people that are realists, people that are cynical about power, that are so above it all, that they see this that no one else can see. But it's not the case. In a recent Substack article called Ideas Have Consequences, Mike from Imperium Press, which published my best-selling book, The Populist Illusion, buy it now, recognised this fact that I've been talking about by pointing out some cold, hard truths to people who don't want to hear it. Now, note here, the substack that he's referencing to support his point is titled Ideas Have Consequences. And he's going to use this, the substack article, Ideas Have Consequences, to argue that ideas and ideology are inconsequential. It's worth quoting him at length. There's a view implicit in much modern thought that we could call the Hesiodic view of history, 
that ideas start out pure and only later become corrupted. Often this view is applied to things that are quasi-religious. The Enlightenment, in the eyes of Steven Pinker, was a miraculous, sui generis event that issued from we know not where, because the price of liberty is eternal vigilance or something. We just kind of forgot how to be liberal, and now the horizon is darkened by the looming spectres of communism and fascism. Apart from the fact that any idea whose price is eternal vigilance is weak and unnatural, this view is contradicted at every step by the actual history of ideas. Religions, ideologies, movements, value systems, these don't always or even usually start out pure and become corrupted over time. Ideologies start out beholden to circumstances, and as those circumstances change, the ideology either adapts itself to those circumstances or it dies. In fact, most of the time, we see the precise opposite of the Hesiodic view. Ideologies very often start out as malleable and heterogeneous, then rid themselves of their impure elements and become more fixed and internally coherent over time. As the ideology consolidates power, it gains influence over just those circumstances to which it was beholden. It can increasingly influence those circumstances more than it is influenced by them. The early NSDAP, which is to say the German National Socialists or the Nazis in the vernacular, with membership not much over 50, was not in a position to influence much of anything. And at this early stage, its ideas were very much in flux. These few dozen men meeting in a beer hall had a worldview much less settled than did the fully consolidated Reich, with its strict command structure, party offices, parliamentary groups and media apparatus. National socialism was a, was a worldview in the process of development, a process which was not yet worked out at the time of its destruction to say nothing of its infancy. So if we are to look for authentic national socialist orthodoxy, we must look primarily to the post-consolidation era. If the worry is that power struggles contaminate ideological purity, look to the shape of the ideology when the struggles were more or less over. Had Germany won the war, you would have seen yet more consistent and purist national socialism, just as you did with liberal democracy. Liberalism was never more liberal than when all its enemies had been destroyed at the end of history. This is troubling to the likes of Jordan Peterson and Steven Pinker, who try to draw a line between embryonic liberalism and mature liberalism. But this is simply not tenable. This is not a historical rule. Sometimes revolution does sunder the father from the son, as happened in the classical world vis-à-vis -vis the archaic world. But in the case of National Socialism and contemporary liberalism, there can be no question. The end was the fulfilment and not the rejection of the beginning. Now, another way of saying all this is that no ideology survives contact with reality for long, unaltered, and will only fully realise itself in practice rather than in theory. When Benito Mussolini marched on Rome in 1922, he did not lay out the principles of fascism from A to Z. In fact, the true shape of fascism would not be formalised for several years after he took power. He said only, and I quote, Our programme is simple. We want to rule Italy. Now say what you want about Mussolini, but like James I, he was more honest than most leaders. This is one of several reasons behind why I have focused on what I have called the negative vision, or clear them out, that I have on perfecting so-called ideology, which in the end does not matter in the slightest, since it is downstream of power. Now, this is frankly baffling, because he quotes this article at length, and then he draws a conclusion that's like completely in contradiction to what he just read. This article itself 
is an argument against his entire thesis in this video. So the point of the Substack article by Imperium Press that he's quoting here is, you know, there's a, there's a sort of ideological kernel, there's an essence to an idea uh, like liberalism or fascism. And, you know, it, it evolves over time. It doesn't start as this pure, perfectly worked ide ideology. Uh, it kind of becomes what it is um, through its interactions in the real world, through its development. So, you know, this would be the kind of argument to say, to push back against people that say, well, you can't call the system liberalism because, you know, early liberals would have rejected a lot of the extreme sort of minoritarian uh, sentiment and, and a lot of the things that's associated with liberalism now. And with this argument, you'd say, well, yeah, but there was this sort of moral kernel of liberalism that worked itself out over time. Uh, and so now that liberalism is hegemonic, this is like a truer form of liberalism. What academic agent is drawn from this is that ideas, when they come into power, just become, um, they lose their ideological essence and just begin to serve power. And so the conclusion will be, you know, whether it was fascism or liberalism that came to power in um, Central European countries in the mid-20th century, it would have all come out in the wash the same, because that's just ideology, that's just ideas. Um, once it comes into contact with power, then it has to work itself out in what serves power and it has to do these compromises, and it all comes out in the wash the same. Well, that's completely in contradiction to the substack uh, he's quoting. Um, which is saying that in the case of something like National Socialism, that through its interactions, um, if it's dead in power uh, after the Second World War, that you would have seen like a true, uh, you would have seen like the true essence of National Socialism then. Uh, so in other words, ideas survive contact with power. Um, and not only that, but they can work themselves out uh, and come out with this more sort of um, totalizing aspect of themselves. This completely, again, this completely runs against what academic agent is arguing. And somehow he's, he's drawn from this, the conclusion that ideas don't survive contact with power. I mean, maybe I'm misunderstanding here, but it seems like that's like literally the opposite of the point of the article he just read. Now, as far as uh, looking to fascism and saying, well, they just said that they wanted to rule um, and saying that it was just, uh, it was like a, a non-ideological movement that just wanted power. Well, you know, okay, they weren't rigidly uh, ideological. Um, you know, they cared about sort of practical, pragmatic things. They weren't super uh, rigid on economics, um, but they did have an ideology that united them, obviously. And what did fascism come out of? Well, it came out of intellectuals, most of whom were former Marxists. It came out of, you know, who invented fascism? It's Giovanni Gentile, an Italian philosopher who's this, like, uh, Hegelian scholar who has uh, this Hegelian criticism of Marx's uh, materialism and comes up with this metaphysical system of absolute idealism. It came from, like, uh, this work that was going on in terms of theorizing uh, Italian nationalism, people like Mazzini and uh, Alfredo Rocco, um, that were like theorizing a, a nationalist political philosophy as a third way between capitalism and communism. So it was early on, it was an intellectual movement, and Mussolini came from the left um, and was interested in this uh, intellectually. And then, yes, it grew into a vanguard, it grew into a, a people's movement. Um, did it become more pragmatic once it entered power? Sure, but uh, the idea that this this particular historical case supports his claim that what happens is just uh, people come with uh, with no ideology behind them and then they just uh, take power and do whatever. Well, of course not. Obviously, Mussolini governed different than the Social Democratic Party would have if they got into power. Um, ideology the ideology that came out of these intellectuals obviously influenced the way he governed in terms of he began to implement things like corporatism and um, you know nationalize the the banking sector in, in Italy and uh, move on this more sort of militaristic footing. These are all downstream from the ideas that were formulated by um, early fascist theorists. It doesn't all come out in the wash the same. Ideas influence how people govern. But second, and much more importantly, this author is doing his best to deny the fact of what Nietzsche called will to power. 
Let us return to the quotation by Mussolini. He said, Our programme is simple. We wish to govern Italy. They ask us for programmes, but there are already too many. It is not programmes that are wanting for the salvation of Italy, but men and willpower. He needed no other arguments than, the current leaders are bad and Italy needs saving. We are the men to do it. This is the will to power. No one seeks transformational power, which is to say, one that affects a true circulation of elites, for selfish reasons. By definition, selfish careerists will follow the status quo and not seek its overthrow. Now again, when he uses Mussolini in Italian fascism as an example of a movement that was non-ideological but just sought power, and he uses a quote like Mussolini saying, you know, we don't have programs, we're just for Italy. Well, what is Italy? If you're really saying that you're completely non-ideological and that morality and ideas don't factor into it, all the factors into it is self-interest, where do you get the idea of Italy from? Um, this is, you know, this is, it's based on a, a biological reality, it's based on a, a reality of ethnicity, it's based on things in the world. But the idea of working um, through self-sacrifice for your nation, that is ideology. That's not something that just, uh, you know, we're not, Italians aren't like hardwired with this uh, gene called Italy. This is a, an idea. People weren't always uh, consciously nationalist in the form of it being an, uh, a political idea of we're going to rule for what's in the interests of Italy. Um, so he's just not pushing this back far enough. And again, to say that this was like a, a negative vision where, vision where it's just like we want to rule and we don't want our enemies to rule. Well, who is the we? And this is always the problem when academic agents says, I just have a negative vision, I just want to clear them out. Well, who is the them? And who is the us that's clearing them out? Um, I saw someone ask this in the comments section, and he said, well, the them is my enemies, and uh, the we is my friends. Okay, well, how do you determine friend-enemy? You know, this is, this is always the thing, again, with this sort of uh, Nietzschean, sort of cynical NRX um, everything is power view of things. Oh, it's just friend enemy. Okay, it's just friend enemy. What determines who's the friend and what's what determines who's the enemy? Okay, so it's not as you know, it's not as actual friends. Like, uh, I don't care if if uh, the people that get into power. Uh, I don't care if I know any of them personally. I care if they agree with me. I care if they're going to promote things that I want. Um, so. Friend and enemy is going to be determined by ideas. It's going to be determined by who agrees with us. And that's the friend and people that are against our interests because they have competing ideas about what the good is. They're the enemy. So this divide of friend enemy, and I'm not ideological. I'm just going to um, do things that are good for my friends and do things that are good for my enemies. This is an ideological divide. Uh, this is ideology. You can't determine who is the them and who is the us without having an ideology of what exactly these different groups are moving towards, what their interests are, and which of those interests align with our interests. So this whole everything is just friend-enemy distinction, well, this friend-enemy distinction has been determined along ideological lines in this case. It is always downstream of power and its interests, so that unless your ideology happens to align with those interests, it will not be selected by power unless, that is, you become the power. But in that case, as I have already said, your ideology will not survive contact with reality for long anyway. It will turn into something else, as fascism was quite different in, let's say, 1930 than it was in 1922. So saying that ideology shapes the world around you simply says, if you want to take it down to ultimate causes, Power shapes the world around us. Liberal democracy in the 19th century meant free trade and voluntary association and the spirit of laissez-faire. But this was only because free trade suited the British Empire. Britain was the first shipping nation, the leading industrial economy, the supreme naval power and the largest colonial network. Advocacy for free trade in Britain 
was little more than a disguised request for free commercial enterprise to the whole world, including territories controlled by their rivals. Classical liberalism was the post hoc justification for all of this. In fact, the British Empire was straightforwardly mercantilist and protectionist until at least about 1846. The repeal of the Corn Laws represented the final defeat of the old landed aristocracy who represented rural and agricultural Britain. The period of laissez-faire effectively ended by about 1890, when it was no longer politically expedient to support it. The British Empire was run by industrialists, principally for industrialists, and so liberal democracy reflected this. When managerialism took root, the USA, which had taken over as world hegemon by that point, was run by managers, principally for managers, and so liberal democracy reflected this. Managerialism loves the invisible war, as I've already alluded to. The war on poverty, the war on crime, the war on drugs, the war on terror, the war on COVID-19, the war on racism, the war on sexism, the war on homophobia, the war on transphobia, the war on climate change, and so on and so forth ad nauseum. It does it because each ratchet enlarges the scope of its power and its control. Liberal democracy will be this until it is no longer politically expedient for it to be so, and then it will become something else again, or else until those in power decide to dispense with liberal democracy altogether. Again, we're back to question begging here where he says everything that the system does is to increase its own power, um, and that's just, that's just assumed. But if we go through these things... People are making decisions. People are in these positions of power. If it's US foreign policy, uh, it's determined by things like the Council on Foreign Relations that are populated by people with certain interests. Now, okay, he'll agree with that. He'll say, yes, their interests are just power. Well, no, these people have ideas. These people have moral systems that impact how they govern. He uses something like the Iraq war as if this was something that was just bound to happen by these sort of logic of liberal democracy, just the logic of power that the Iraq war was necessary to maintain power. It's not true. It was hugely costly. Uh, in many ways, it was, uh, you know, it was not a good thing for the stability of the American empire. Many things they've done in foreign policy haven't been. If it was just purely about preserving power, um, you know, there's, there are things that would be different in Middle East policy, like having friendly relations with Iran or something. The case of the Iraq war, it's very clear, you can watch my video on the Iraq war, there were people that were hyper-ideological, um, that were hyper-ideological Zionists that wanted to influence foreign policy because of their ideological motivations. Their chief concern wasn't, um, this will be in the interests of preserving and expanding the power of this apparatus. Uh, no, people are motivated by... Um, more serious, more fundamental things than just this uh, abstraction of power. And when he talks about, you know, some of the um, rights movements that have kicked off in the West, same thing again. Uh, do certain people sort of push this cynically? Um, you know, will corporate interests use this cynically? Sure, but that's not a complete explanation of this. People come out of the university systems um, and they learn these sort of, they learn this way of seeing the world. They learn this moral system in the universities and they, they imbibe it through social media and through the, the general climate and people actually do believe in this stuff. It's not like everyone in power is just like cynically going along with let's pretend to believe in civil rights, uh, let's pretend to believe in LGBT rights and all this stuff uh, to increase our power. No, they believe their own stuff um, and it just this sort of circular way of looking at things where, well, I'm the cynic and I'm the realist because I realize that anyone with any power just behaves completely cynically uh, and pragmatically. It's just not the case. It just it doesn't conform with history. Do things get a certain deterministic logic, uh, you know, when economic factors begin to determine things and when the sort of merchant class becomes dominant and they can just... Um, patron ideas that are beneficial to them, sure, but there's all kinds of interactions going on here. Um, and there is, you know, this embryonic form of liberalism that develops itself and that is fundamentally imbibed by the majority of the population. 
uh, it's not all just power politics. You can look at something like um, you know U.S. antagonism to Russia. Can you just explain this as this was just purely the geopolitical interests of the United States? Uh, I would say no. I would say again, people that are in the U.S. State Department, like Victoria Newland, all these people, the Kagan family, they have interests beyond this abstraction of power. They have ideological interests. Many of these people, like neoconservatives, they, you know, they truly believe in this stuff about spreading freedom and spreading liberalism and spreading democracy and spreading the free market. This is something that motivates their actions. So again, just to say that ideology doesn't motivate action, and if it does, as soon as you come into contact with power, uh, you're no longer going to be motivated by the ideology. What directs power? Is it just this abstract uh, force that's just progressing through the universe? It's just acquiring more and more power, but there's other power centers. Uh, why is there a conflict between them? Oh, it's just different people. Um, it's just friends and enemies. Well, uh, you know, what's, what's the divide? Because, uh, again, clearly it's ideological. If you say, I just want my friends in power, well, you know, if, if you're a British person and you're a, a British sort of nationalist and you want, you just care about your friends, so you just care about sort of the interests of the British people, well, it's not like you're just going to be happy regardless of whatever British people are in government, right? Um, I mean, the, the Irish government is, is made up entirely of Irish people and Irish nationalists aren't happy with that government because of the ideas those people have. Power isn't just this abstract thing. Ideas influence power. And it's not just post hoc rationalization. Uh, you know, religious conversions happen and that changes how power works. Sometimes, you know, religious conversion happens on a smaller level uh, and rulers become beholden to the influence and to the power of this religious group. Uh, it's not just this one way thing of power just sort of deciding what's good for it and shaping the universe in this way. It's just. Very simplistic, it's not how things work, and again, the whole point of this video is just this kind of question begging, where he says, well, look, there's all these different justifications, there's all these different arguments going on in philosophy, and, oh, it's all words, really, um, but what's real is power, and power determines what comes out on top from these ideas, so therefore, there's no right or wrong, there's just what power determines, it does not follow, and if you really believe this, why are you critiquing the system? What problem do you have with the system? It, my problem with the system is my friends aren't in charge. Well, who are your friends? It's not your personal friends, so it's people that agree with you. So your problem is that your ideology isn't in charge. Um, and if that's not it, if that's just post hoc rationalization, if you're truly non-ideological, if it's truly just self-interest, then sit down and figure out what's in your best interest. And probably it's uh, not to um, go on the internet um, under your real name, uh, criticizing power. It's probably to uh, get into the system and just make as much money as you can and just uh, gain as much power and influence as you can. Uh, and yet, and yet, the people that profess this stuff um, continue to criticize the system and continue to bemoan the system and call it evil and call the rulers satanic and all this stuff. So I don't think they've really thought this through. I don't think this worldview uh, makes much sense because the end result of this worldview would just be to, you know, just shut up and go work in the system um, and just make, again, make as much money as you can. But here we are. Um, for some reason, people are criticizing the system, uh, putting themselves at, at risk, at social ostracization and so on. And why do they do that? And there's also this tendency to see this as some kind of weakness. But this is the whole strength of a political movement. If you want power and the enemy has all the incentive structures, the enemy has power, the enemy has the financial incentives, the enemy can get you fired from your job, they can take away your social media, they can take away your payment processors. There's no selfish, uh, I'm going to follow, follow my biological impulse uh, and you know become a, a political radical and um, get ostracized. There's no impulse for that. If you, even if you say, well, oh, on the group level, it's good for the group survival to push a, a political ideology that's in your group interest. Well, that may be true, but in your immediate sort of uh, genetic interest, um, that is not really your concern. It's more your, your concern, go and have as, as many kids as you can and make as much money as you can. So what the ideology, what, the, what any political movement requires is self-sacrifice. How do you get people to self-sacrifice? By believing that their 
beliefs have moral righteousness driving them by believing that they have the truth on their side. You know, were the Irish hunger strikers um, in the 1980s, you know, was, was Bobby Sands uh, like starving himself to death as a post hoc rationalization for his uh, selfish biological impulse? Or was that a case of moral righteousness and a feeling of, of truth and justice being so powerful that it actually overrode a biological impulse to the point of death? Seems like a, a difficult question for this side to answer. And moreover, you know, this idea that like morality or belief in truth is just weakness, well, the, you know, the thing that makes people sacrifice, the thing that makes people uh, you know, guns don't kill people. It's, people use the guns. And what motivates people to pick up guns is ideas. What motivates people to build a political party is ideas. What motivates people to raise money, to self-sacrifice, do any of these things is ideas. Uh, and not just some abstract, wouldn't that be nice idea, but an idea that they feel is righteous because it's true. This is how politics work. This is, this is why people compete for power. Lenin really did believe in Marxist economic theory. Mussolini really did believe in fascism. Tony Blair really does believe in liberal democracy as a universal system that's going to benefit everyone and bring everyone out of poverty and give us all uh, tolerance and pluralism and an end to conflict. And these are the people that shape the world. These are the people that become motivated to make change in the world. And so this totally cynical, um, abstract, it's just an abstract force of power doing what it will. It just does not conform uh, to reality. And I think it's very destructive. And like I said, ultimately, it's self-refuting. So uh, I guess that's all for now. Um, yeah. If you enjoyed this, subscribe, subscribe to me on Telegram, all that good stuff. And yeah, take care.